Sean, I'm worried. If we cut drug prices, there'll be no innovation. How about we try it and see what happens? Welcome to Care Talk, your weekly home for incisive debate about healthcare business and policy. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. All right, John, what do you got cooked up for us today? I, well, we have in the emerging world of vaccine, drug pricing, a new administration, an expert on all of that, Dr. Peter Bach, uh, a, a, one of my great mentors in terms of understanding how screwed up our drug pricing and development world is, with some thoughts, insights, and perhaps some insults about how we can improve where we are. Peter, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me, John. So, Peter, how did you get into this drug pricing development political landmine area? It cer certainly seems to be an area where America has only overachieved in terms of pricing and then followed with development. Yeah, um, I, I ended up here because I wasn't smart enough to actually do real science. And but I so I ended up like many people who study the healthcare system, focusing on what comes after good science and asking questions like, if we have a therapy that actually improves health, what, why isn't that therapy getting to people? And if you start folk asking that question with regard to drugs, then you immediately come to because they cost too much, because the economics are messed up, because the way we price stratify uh, in the U.S. causes huge out-of-pocket costs, because we keep thinking we have a market instead of what we actually have, which is a policy-guaranteed set of monopolies that we poorly regulate. And the other reason I got here was I somewhat naively went into government, uh, the best decision I ever made, but naively in the sense that I didn't realize to what extent policies had been rejiggered to an almost guarantee price inflation and loss of access uh, to pharmaceuticals and particularly in my area of interest, which is in oncology and cancer drugs, which has been absolutely exploding. But once I saw that the system is actually engineered and the regulatory and payment environment was inflationary by its very nature, I thought, okay, this is a problem I can wrap my head around and should be working on fixing because new treatments that actually help patients with cancer should be affordable and get to them. And we should fix the market to make sure that happens. Peter, there's a lot of concern, you know, about cancer drugs um, in general in this country. People don't like the idea of rationing. And there's a concern if you, you know, limit what prices can be, you're going to keep these therapies off the market and the patients are, are, are going to suffer. I mean, how do you reconcile that? Well, it's a C-suite talking point. It's not reality. We ration healthcare in this country much more than any other advanced economy in the world. And the way we ration is, you know, just regressive. So I'm not really concerned that given that we pay 2x plus higher prices in the U.S. for drugs than most other countries, you know, even after adjusting for purchasing power or currency or whatever you want to adjust for, that if we paid somewhat more rational prices, we wouldn't still have uh, widespread access. You also have to remember that, you know, access to whom in the sense that if we continue to say we need a market counterbalancing mechanism where on one side there's the buyers, mostly you know PBMs and hospitals, and on the other side there's the seller, manufacturers, and there's intermediaries in there, you know, wholesalers and stuff. But if you say one of them gets to charge as much as it possibly can, the drug company, and the other one has to negotiate to get lower prices, and then those negotiating tools are primarily things like blocking access, either through step therapy or prior auth, or shifting costs onto individuals when those costs can be, you know, monumental with respect to even annual income of most people with illness. You know, you're essentially saying, we're going to let lower income people eat the consequences of our not being able to craft effective policy. So that's why, you know, any argument about rationing has to start with, well, what rationing are we going to get rid of now before we start thinking about what rationing good policy might actually cause? 
But Peter, you know, I, when I argue with pharma executives, they say, well, gosh, if you started to cut those prices or cap those prices or actually allow the largest purchaser of drugs in the world, the United States government, to negotiate, well, then there's no incentive to actually develop the drugs. Like why you'd be killing the industry, you know, sort of, sort of, you know, sort of cooking the golden goose, as it were. Yeah. I mean, it, look, it's a, it's a carefully honed talking point. And uh, they've been using it for at least two decades when prices were a third of what they are today after adjusting for inflation. And so I don't really get it. Like that, they were saying you'll blow up a successful industry 20 years ago when we were paying much less. Now we have to pay higher rates and we blow it. We can't even regress to that point. Uh, so you know, but these kinds of absolutist statements don't ha hold up to scrutiny on any of the dimensions you might want to challenge them on. For instance, uh, the bill that was introduced in the House that would have Medicare negotiate drug prices and have those prices actually float into the commercial market produced enormous savings and was estimated to slow the pace of innovation by two or three percent with innovation measured as the rate of new drug approvals. But on the flip side, it was projected to save more than a hundred billion dollars in not spending on drugs, but in spending on other kinds of health care like hospital visits, because drugs, when their prices fell, would get used more. And so there's a basic formulation here that's just sort of absolutist when it really should be in any terms thought of in terms of trade-offs. The other part is at every turn, we're told that every new drug and every new indication is the innovation we need, even though sometimes those new therapies are for very few people. Often those new therapies or new indications are only marginally effective. But we're force fed this idea that everyone is kind of infinitely valuable or has no price that can be put on it because, you know, it's health and stuff. So normal markets don't work like that. If you have truly killer new products, you get you can charge really aggressive prices. And if you don't, you don't have a market. But in this case, there's laws in place requiring markets. There's intermediaries that make money uh, buying and reselling your product at more costs. So there's all these things in place that say, you know, that reinforce this notion that every new drug is kind of can't be priced. And that's why, why we are where we are. But Peter, everybody realizes that drugs are too expensive. It's a bipartisan issue. You talk to, you know, left-wing talk radio has been on that for years. Now right-wing talk radio is on the fact because everyone has relatives who can barely afford or can't afford the drugs that they need. Now that if we've got popular agreement on that, what should government do right now that would help solve this, 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 this huge and only getting bigger social problem of access to drugs at a reasonable price? Yeah, um, it's true. Uh, it's at the two ends of the spectrum on talk radio and trying to get it from the two ends of the spectrum up on Capitol Hill is our challenge. Uh, and, you know, there's you can think about this strategy from a number of perspectives. I like to think about them along the gradient of which Rubicons that are politically challenging or let's just say stick with the metaphor, deep and fast running water uh, are the hardest to cross. And so I generally favor starting with let's enforce the social contract that the pharmaceutical industry has agreed to, which is that after a fixed period of monopoly pricing, prices go down and drugs are cheap. And so we've done a lot of work pointing out that biologic drugs, which are about 2% prescriptions and 40% of spending right now, uh, have maintained monopolies vastly longer than the 12 years that were set out in the BPCIA, the law that created the biosimilar follow-on, and that the biosimilar market has turned into a great market for biosimilar manufacturers, which is exactly what we don't want. Right? We want it to be an aggressive cutthroat market that looks like generic companies with those generic margins, but instead Pfizer and Amgen and uh, Novartis have marched in there and they're like, oh, I recognize operating margins like that. 
I'll take some of it. So you're saying just just to, just for those who aren't following the, the and, and by the way, thanks for the classical reference. You must have gone to Harvard. Uh, uh, but but the, the Romans, you know, we, we uh, it, was a, it was a low application here. The, um, uh, how do, so how do you think about that though? Like, are you saying that we just could enforce the law now and have a different result? Yeah. So I, I'm sorry for quickly getting in the weeds. I all I was thinking about was you know rivers in Italy, but the although I think I've I'm not sure it was. Uh, so here's the problem. If you're going to leave money for new drugs, you need older drugs that are big market players to eventually give up their pricing power. And the theory with generic drugs entering after you know five to seven years or so against the big sellers that are small molecules or chemical drugs, the Lipitors, uh, from the 80s worked well. And when we got these biologic drugs, we tried to reinvent the same system using biosimilars and it hasn't worked and it really won't. It's just created more profitable players. And so we can't enforce current law. It's current law that has failed. We need new law. And what we should do is say, in this context, biologic drug makers, you get 12 years of monopoly power, and then you sell at cost plus, which is what, if a truly hyper-competitive market were in place, would drive you to. And so we've been trying to get policymakers to see that their objective is these kind of, if you will, marginal economic cost of biologic drugs, you know, cost plus, or however you want to think about it, super competitive pricing uh, after exclusivity. Biosimilars aren't going to get us there. So you should regulate prices. So really what you're saying, though, just to take all the economic phrases out, is they claim that there's a market that's competitive and it's structured so it's not. So they will never, without new law, we will never have the prices come down. Well, right. That's even for well, the biologic drugs that face any competition. Most of them are long past the date they should have been faced zero competition. It's just this is a natural monopoly to again back to get back to economic terms. But this is a market that will not fit, have the kind of robust competition you want to get the policy goals. So go ahead and regulate prices. And I think that's the easiest place to start. There has been no kind of negotiating by Medicare in a policy like that. We're not importing drugs from Canada. We're not importing prices from Germany. We're not importing health technology assessment from the UK. We're not taking marching in on patents. We're not doing any of that stuff, which I think are the various Rubicons that are going to be more difficult to afford. And so the real challenge here is, can we even do that? Can we even, when we have a very clear policy objective that really is widely agreed upon, even by the pharmaceutical industry, can we simply write laws that get us there? And I'm not sure we can. So we have, you know, when you talk about health technology assessments, so in the UK, they have ICE, uh, NICE rather, and and in the US, we have ICER, at least, which is, you know. And we have ICE. Which is NICER, ICER. We have ICE also. Yeah, I think they are thinking of getting rid of ICE, but maybe that's not happening right now. But with ICER, I think one of the challenges with the negotiating the drug prices or even just saying what it should be is that people say, well, if it's my family, you know, I want to, you know, you can't put a price on that. And that, they think the drug industry has played off of that, but there are ways to look at it, you know, in a more rational kind of a manner. And so even when you've got a monopoly or you've got something like biosimilars that aren't really working out, something like ISA would say, like, here's what the price should be rationally. Is that an approach that works methodologically and could work politically as well? Uh, yes and yes, uh, both challenging, but just to be clear, a couple of things. So let's just take as ICER, what health technology assessment, let's just call that, I don't know, an adequate standard for a discussion. Uh, the first point, which is that everybody wants more of everybody else's money for their own kind of vow benefit uh, is not a unique problem to drugs. It's true in every market. And so it doesn't surprise, shouldn't surprise us that people want, you know, the town to invest in the subway stop closest to them, more than one in a different borough if you live in New York, or clean up the parks that are closest to them so their kids can play in it. And so everybody will look at, oh, look, it's this pool of money. I want more of it to come to benefit my family. Sure, normal reaction. Doesn't work, you know, it is the death knell of collective action at some level. But 
the that's one part. But more importantly, a couple clarifications. One is this idea of value-based pricing, paying for drugs based on how well they work, how many qualities they generate, is exclusively limited to the period when a drug has its monopoly. Right? It is the reward, it's the prize, and they only get it for a certain period of time. It's not designed for this other part of the market where things are supposed to fall to cost. Right? So people will say, you know, what should we be paying for aspirin and stuff like that? That's irrelevant. Right? What should we be paying for Lipitor today? This is only during that kind of socially contracted period where high prices are supposed to be high. But the other thing is it's not the price that we should be, tra it's not the dollars that we should be transferring to the innovator. It's the ceiling of what should be transferred. Not because it's an efficient price to spur innovation. That's a different number and that's what we should be transferring to the innovator. We just have to figure out what it is. What it is is a ceiling because any dollar a month above that is money we could use more effectively on something else, on a different medical treatment, again, on restoring a park, on fixing a subway station, on educating children, on military, which well, pick your poison there. But it, just, it just signals like, okay, that's enough money above that. Now we're really spending inefficiently, but that doesn't mean the innovator should get all that money either. We just want, you know, just a story here, if I can digress, it's worth the, it's not really a story because I can't give you any of the confidential information. So uh, just here's the thought experiment. Drugs like Herceptin got go decisions in the late 1980s or Humira in the mid 1990s. Do you think there's any way when a company like Genentech or AbbVie looked at developing those drugs, they said, we're going to be able to capture the prices they're capturing today. And that drove that go decision. And the answer is, of course not. Nobody could anticipate the price inflation we've had. That number that they had in the spreadsheet when they made the go decision, that's the number that we had to be able to deliver. Not 10x, not 20x where we are today, because that's what it took to spur the innovation. Yeah, Peter, I think people don't have the context that drugs now cost as much in, in ter terms of total medical cost as hospitals do. I mean, they, they, it's sort of the, the, the cost problem in healthcare that's eating the entire system. And to your point, it's also, you know, kind of costing us parks and, and cops and a whole series of other things, because ultimately there's only so many dollars to go around. But so let's, let's maybe try to close this out with what's your lightning round recommendations for the Biden administration? What are three things the Biden administration and Congress could do to solve this drug pricing problem at the time when the world now loves biopharma and drug companies because they're delivering the vaccine? So we are we are in a politically volume you know, sort of you know, sort of fluid time. But you've got the president's ear. You're talking to Schumer and Speaker Pelosi. What are the three things they should move on right now? Yeah, well, I keep sending them emails and I just must have the wrong email address. Uh, I think they're busy getting rid of the viruses and they think one's in your email instead of in your bloodstream. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, first of all, what I've already mentioned. Absolutely. You know, clamp down on the exclusivity period and make sure prices fall to marginal cost or, you know, affordable levels immediately after exclusivities ended uh, either through the introduction of competition or price regulation. Number two, uh, there are a series of deeply problematic incentives throughout the distribution chain. Uh, doctors get to mark up drugs on a percentage basis. Hospitals, unbelievable markups, especially in the commercial rate, commercial space, that are uh, positive incentives for inflation. That's also true in the intermediary space. And the last thing is, focus on the monopolies that are in the distribution system and break them up, particularly on the pharmacy benefit manager side. We are down to approximately three PBMs. And that means the worst of what monopolies do, they don't need to actually offer decent products anymore. They can capture from every side more of the money. And so if we break them up, they will actually 
move into a position where they must offer decent products, which will be products that have lower priced drugs. I have no problem with using health technology assessment as a fourth thing for launch prices of drugs, but it's the district. If we are a market oriented country, these are the things we need to do. Well, great. Well, thank you. It's always three. So you asked for three, we got a bonus for it. I hope, I hope we'll not have to pay extra for that fourth one. But uh, in any case, uh, that's it for another edition of Care Talk. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. Thank you, Peter. Uh, this has been this has been wonderful. Uh, it's my pleasure. And David, I'm going to use the pharma model for that because I added on a fourth thing. I want another three years of monopoly protection. Listen, let's talk rebates when we're off the line here and we'll figure it out. I think the other thing that we all have to remember is at the end of the day, a drug pricing problem ends up with a frail senior, a budget constrained middle class person, a rich person, none of whom can afford the drugs or the healthcare costs that they're suffering from every day. You're on an incredibly important topic. Thanks for sharing your wisdom with us today. I'm John Driscoll with CEO of Carecentrics. Thanks for listening.